Coming up in the program, we'll bring you all the best highlights from three hours of Shanghai. We'll get you right up to date with the season so far. Fractions of a second make all the difference at the sharp end of racing. We'll show you why. With many different cars on the grid, we'll show you which ones are the cream of the crop. And we'll get down and dirty with a look of what goes into the engines of these high-powered machines. So sit back, hold tight, and join us for more Asian Le Mans Series action. Before we get into all the action from Shanghai, let's take a quick look back at the second race of the season in Japan. After a successful opening race in Inji, Korea, the 2014 Asian Le Mans Series continued with three hours of action-packed drama at Fuji International Speedway. As ever, there was a close fought battle in the LMP2 category between reigning champions Oak Racing Team Total and Eurasia Motorsport. Eurasia had been desperate to turn the tide in their favour and qualified in pole position by just one one hundredth of a second. But Richard Bradley had trouble starting the car on the grid and by the time he had served a two minute penalty for getting outside assistance, Oak's Keiko Ihara had established a two lap lead. Japanese driver Ihara was making history as the first female behind the wheel in the Asian Le Mans series, but she ran into problems after a fast start when she hit a tyre wall on lap 23. Fortunately, she was able to bring the Morgan Judd back to the pits in one piece, but that allowed Eurasia to take the lead. Eurasia's John Hartshorn had taken over from Chinese driver Pu Junjin, but there was more drama as Hartshorn drew a stop-go penalty for speeding in pit lane. And after three lead changes, Oak's Hope in Tung then went to the front. Tung held on for the win, giving himself and co-driver David Chang their fourth straight race victory dating back to last season, while Bradley completed the race for Eurasia, who claimed second place. Meanwhile, in the CN class, Team Avalon Formula's Dennis Lian started aggressively and led in the early part of the race. But Kraft Bamboo Racing held on well through Samson Chan, and the two cars battled throughout the first half of the race. Kraft's Kevin C then got his team in P1, and once he handed over to star driver Matthias Besch, the result was never in doubt, with Kraft Bamboo romping home for the win. As in the season opener in Korea, the GT category saw fierce competition throughout, with all Team 3 AAI cars swapping positions. The number 91 car soon moved up into P1, though the number 90 SLS AMG took the category lead later in the race. But the Mercedes suffered some technical issues in the final half hour of the race, which allowed number 91's Tatsuya Tanigua to claim the win, with the number 92 car in second. Meanwhile, the GTAM class was won by Emperor Racing's number 11 Lamborghini Gallardo. As the series continues to embed itself into the Asian motorsport calendar and its appeal and popularity across a wide TV audience also continues to grow, the appeal of iconic Le Mans brand of racing takes a firm hold in Asia. But as that debut season showed, nothing is certain until the final race of the year comes to a close. Let's catch up with Mark Thomas, team management and drivers, and to get their thoughts on the season so far. I think if we look back at where we are with the season so far, we're pretty much in line with where we were in expectations. On the communication front, we've uh, now established a, a great uh, production for TV, and our distribution has been expanded on TV to not only include a pan-Asian uh, distribution, but also now we can be seen around the world in Europe, America, and the Middle East as well. Well, I think this season's been going really good. Uh, you know, right off the bat, we've won the first two races, so it can't really get any better than that. It's nice to have some competition. It's always fun to have another car out there to play around with. Shanghai is a great circuit. It's a Formula One track. It's got a very long straight, over one mile over the back there. It's got that contrast of high-speed corners, fast straights, and very slow corners. This championship has a couple of new circuits this year, uh, which is quite exciting. I mean, I've raced at Shanghai before. I raced here in 2008 in single-seaters. I really like the circuits. I'm, I'm glad we're racing here. 
comparison from the Asian Le Mans series in comparison to the American, like let's say the Tudor series or the, the Blanc Pass series in Europe, I think mainly is the number of starters because the organization here is also quite, quite professional. They know what to do, they have a lot of experience. The best thing about the Asian Le Mans series uh, for a team is it allows us to develop and become a world-class team. Um, it, it, Asian Le Mans is run just like European Le Mans or the WEC. A lot of the officials are the same, the rules are the same, the regulations are the same, and we're running with the same cars. Absolutely crucial that the, the, the championship continues to mandate that at least one driver from Asia Pacific is in Asian Le Mans because it's such a young market here. We need to make sure that we're providing the progression for the talent that's here. You know, there's huge populations here, but it's a very new sport. I think the best thing that Asian Le Mans is actually doing for motorsports in Asia is the fact that you're bringing the whole Le Mans concept, the spirit of endurance racing, and it puts us, you know, if anybody who inspires or aspires to go into Le Mans racing, Le Mans 24, definitely it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to do all that learning in Asia, and then hopefully one day we can take it to the Le Mans 24. Basically, learn a little bit, maybe schedule a little bit better, because I think some of the scheduling this year was clashing with other races. So we want to improve the scheduling to make it easier for teams and drivers to get involved, which will hopefully stimulate the grid and consolidate the rest of the strategy behind it, the relationship with uh, local circuits and partners in each individual country, and also with our commercial partners going forward. The Asian Le Mans series returns to China to the Shanghai International Circuit, which also plays host to the Formula One Grand Prix. This circuit built in 2004 is 4.604 kilometers and has 14 challenging corners. And the three hours of Shanghai gets underway and Oak Racing Team Total got off to a flying start at the front consolidating the lead that they had built in the qualifying session. David Chang's number one Morgan Judd was first into Turn 1, followed by LMP2 rivals Eurasia Motorsport, with Team AI's number 90 Mercedes-Benz GT3 completing the top three with no changes at the front in the opening stages. But one of the other Team AAI cars was less fortunate, with a number 92 slipping to the back of the field early on, having started in fifth position. But the first big battle was for P2, with John Hartson opening the race for Eurasia Motorsport, but struggling to find the pace early on. Japanese driver Takeshi Tsuchiya was right behind him and pushing hard, before finding a way through while still on the first lap. Behind those two were the pair of CN category cars, from Team Avalon Formula and Kraft Bamboo Racing. And the cars continued to battle early on, with Kraft's Samson Chan in the Ligier finding a way past Bellotti in the Avalon Wolves GB08, with a smart move up the inside. But the opening lap of the three hours of Shanghai proved yet again why endurance racing is set to take Asia by storm, with cars from each of the three racing categories vying for places both within and outside their own divisions. Out in front, reigning driver's champion David Cheng had started aggressively and was starting to open up a big gap during the opening stint, 
consistently lapping in the 1 minute 43 to 1 minute 44 second range, which was 4 or 5 seconds a lap quicker than Hartshorn in the other LMP2 car. There was drama on lap 6 as number 33, Mokweng Sun in Clearwater Racing's Ferrari 458 GT3, went past Jun Sang Chen in the number 91 Team AAI to go up into 6th position overall, but second in the GT category. It was just a small preview of what was to come as the Ferrari and the BMW remained within striking distance all afternoon long. Mokweng San is a vastly experienced Malaysian driver who, along with co-driver Kieta Sawa, recently nabbed a couple of podium finishes at the same track in Shanghai. Mini battles were developing all over the track, while Suchia was still keeping pace with Hartshorn, despite supposedly driving in a less powerful category. Samson, Chan and Belotti were stuck together a little further behind, with Chan now in front and sitting in fourth overall. The Italian Belotti was making his Asian Le Mans series debut, but he was quickly into his stride and was pushing Chan hard. Belotti had talked before the race of his excitement about driving on the famous Shanghai track, saying that the Asia Le Mans series was getting bigger and better race after race with top-class competition. His own partnership with Team Avalon Formula and the Wolf GB08 goes back several years. But the team was set back early in the race weekend when a battery problem meant that the car couldn't take to the track for the second free practice. But Pelotti showed good form in the qualifying session, setting the team's fastest lap time of 1 minute 48.156. Meanwhile, his on-track opponent here, Samson Chan, was making his second straight Asia Le Mans series start, having also replaced Kraft boss Frank Yu as the team's third driver in Fuji. Eurasia Motorsport had deliberately changed their tactics for this race, with team principal Mark Goddard opting to start with John Hartshorn in the car and assigning him the job of limiting the loss to Oak and keeping the car on the lead lap until he could hand over to his quicker teammates and running behind the SLS AMG GT3 car for the first nine laps had certainly not been part of the plan. But after his tentative start, Hartshorn began to settle down, shaving valuable seconds off his lap time, even as Cheng made hay at the front. That, in turn, put some pressure on Takeshi Shuchia in the SLS and he wasn't quite able to maintain the impressive form that he had shown at the start of the race. Hatson did eventually get through, using his superior straight-line speed down one of the long stretches. But it had been a fascinating exchange between the pair. Further ahead, David Cheng was looking to set up a third straight race win for Oak in this year's championship and their fifth in a row dating back to last season. And he had come out of the blocks quickly, setting his fastest lap time of the race on lap nine. In fact, he and the team had the Morgan Judd buzzing to such an extent that he was able to lap the number 92 car as early as the 11th lap of the race, less than 20 minutes in. Cheng had raced in some other series this year, but the Chinese-American driver has really made Le Mans racing his main focus in 2014 and made history when he formed part of the first all-Chinese team along with Adelie Fong and Oak teammate Ko Ping Tung to take part in the 24 hours of Le Mans. Sitting behind the wheel of the number 33 Ligier, the team finished seventh in the LMP2 class earlier this year. Cheng has certainly returned to Asia with some of that form and was showing it here. After already lapping one of the BMWs, next in his sights were the two CN prototype cars. On lap 16, he eased past Belotti's Wolf GB08 before passing Samson Chan's Ligier later on the same lap, no doubt giving him some tips on how to get the most of the car along the way, given his experience in a similar model at Le Mans in France. More importantly though, he had opened up a lead of roughly a minute by this point over LMP2 rivals Eurasia and was continuing to stretch the lead over John Hartshorn with each lap. But with plenty more action still to come, this race was far from over. The top racing class in the Asian Le Mans series is the LMP2. 
or Le Mans Prototype 2 category. It's the final step before the LMP1 class at the top of the Le Mans Racing Pyramid, and all cars must adhere to strict technical specifications. Let's find out more about what makes the LMP2s the fastest cars on the grid. Yeah, so let's say the CN class is the, the entry category for sports car. So the CN class is the lighter car and the engine is less powerful. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, good, uh, a good car to run before, before stepping up to LMP2 class, which has more than force and more horsepower, obviously. We have here the Morgan LMP2 car, so it's a sports car. The strength of this car is obviously the downforce. It carries into the corners, so allowing a very quick cornering speed compared to some other categories. A lot for the LMP2 category is because there is different brands, different type of car. We have open car, we have closed car, and we have different type of engine. We have a V6 with turbocharger engine, and we have a V8. Technical aspect of the LMP2 category is because we, we have the same regulation for all the cars. The LMP2 category is managed by as a cost cap category. That means all the expense, all the price are completely blocked. Yeah, for sure, the, the LMP2 car is a little, a little bit faster than the, than the further CN and the GT cars. Uh, the top speed is quite, uh, is quite close because the GTs are quite fast in the straight and the CN as well. Uh, but yeah, for sure we have a delta lap time, especially again in cornering speed, and that's the main difference between the different series and different categories. LMP2 car is a prototype managed by the ACO regulation. The GT car are GT3 car managed by the FIA regulation, and, and the CN car is a kind of small prototype between LMP2 and then CN, and managed by the FIA regulation with a lot of free things, a lot of free improvement, except the engine. On the CN car, the engine is like a serial engine because all the cars are using the same engine, which is a Honda 2-liter engine. The LMP1 in terms of engineering and performance is a, is a much higher step. Uh, yeah, but for sure it's, uh, it's a, a first step to run sports car and prototypes to run the LMP2. And, but the, at the moment, the technology involved in LMP1 is, remains much higher, so it's uh, difficult to compare. The best thing is to support the spirit of the Le Mans, the spirit of endurance, through the Asian Le Mans series and all over the Asian countries. Back on track, Kraft Bamboo's Samson Chan continued his battle with Avalon's Bellotti throughout the entirety of their first stint. In fact, these two cars were never more than four seconds apart over the first 25 laps, showing how evenly matched the category rivals were. The onus was really on the Avalon team to make the move, given their respective places in the overall team standings. The team had missed the first race of the season in Inje Korea. And though they performed well in Fuji last time out, Kraft Bamboo had secured wins in each of the first two races and two extra points for pole positions, which had given them a total of 52 points compared to the 18 of Avalon for a second place finish in Fuji. Kraft Bamboo again had the edge in qualifying in Shanghai with Chan's teammate Kevin Su besting Bellotti by a second and a half. Now right here under race conditions you can see that the cars are so evenly matched and the Avalon car right at the back there can get close to the bamboo racing car down the long back straight but still quite difficult to get past. Meanwhile, David Cheng was away and clear at the front, but he still had plenty of traffic to negotiate. Up next was Mok Wing Sun in Clearwater Racing's number 33 Ferrari, who was gradually getting quicker and quicker. But here on lap 18, Cheng manages to pass Sun and sets about hunting down his next victim. That turned out to be Takeshi Tsuchiya in the number 90 Team AAI car. And six laps later, Cheng was closing fast behind him. The LMP2 car or Le Mans Prototype 2 cars are clearly the most powerful division in the Asian Le Mans series. Just one step below the top rated LMP1 cars in the endurance racing pyramid. But that's not to say that the GT cars will always politely make way on track. 
especially if it means losing precious seconds in the process. That left Eurasia's John Hartson in the other LMP2 car as the only driver still on the same lap as Cheng, as he was the first man into the pits three quarters of an hour into the race, coming in after completing 25 laps and handing over to teammate Pu Junjin. The idea was that I did the first bit and didn't drop too far behind. Uh, I think it was. Uh, went as well as it could have really, so. While Pu Junjin set about trying to rein in Oak and David Cheng at the front, the two main rivals in the CN prototype division, Kraft Bamboo and Avalon Formula, continued their battle. The brand new series of prototype cars was specifically created for the Asian Le Mans series, and its aim is to provide drivers and teams with a low-cost option into Asian Le Mans series and effectively operates as an LMP3 substitute with a class designed as a stepping stone up to the more powerful LMP2 division. Its launch was a great success, with Team Avalon Formula coming into the series to challenge the initial dominance of Kraft Bamboo Racing and several other teams in the region showing interest as well. With more and more Asian and Chinese drivers going over to Europe to test themselves and their cars in the top division, this category provides another opportunity for those drivers to hone their skills back home before exploring the world stage of motorsports. It also creates a viable option for gentlemen or amateur drivers to experience long-distance racing, another element that will further promote and support one of the region's most prestigious series, which is, of course, overseen by the ACO, the official body for the Le Mans brand. Meanwhile, Pu Junjin was now behind the wheel of the number 27, Oreka Nissan. And though he had a lot of ground to make up on the leading O car, he hit the ground running and was immediately lapping faster than David Cheng. The Chinese driver had previously raced in the Sirocco Cup China and the Formula Masters China Series, but harbors ambitions to get into endurance racing, with one of his stated goals being to win the Le Mans LMP2 race. Now, one of the best elements of Le Mans racing is the combination of different types of cars which each have their respective strengths. And that's the AMG GT3 number 90 blowing past the Ligier with ease down the straights. It has tremendous top-line speed. But then in the cornering section, you can see the number 77 car able to keep pace with the AMG GT3 in front of it, trying to find a way past, just keeping that distance ever so cleanly. Into the pits comes car number 91 and team boss of AAI, Jun San Chen, hands over to Oli Milroy after completing 27 laps. Let's see what he had to say after getting out of the car. You know, the, the 458 have a better straight and uh, I must uh, try to keep my, you know, my safety lines to turn in to keep my position. And uh, during the two laps, maybe the 458 attack is, uh, they cannot overtake. So he is a little bit, little bit hurt. Then uh, when the uh, corner one, then he turned in and he, he tried to, and then he hit my, hit my side. Then uh, my car is uh, suddenly uh, slide out, but uh, I'm quite lucky. I, I, I rescued the car uh, back to the truck. So uh, because if the uh, cor uh, uh, corner one, if I, I I spin out, I think that would be big trouble, difficult to back to the truck. Clearwater Racing's Ferrari entry returned to the Asian Le Mans series after making a highly successful debut at the Sepang stop last year, when it won the GT category in the final race of the year. So it was great to see the number 33 car return to the series in Shanghai, looking for a repeat performance. The Singapore-based Clearwater outfit is one of the most successful GT racing teams in the Asian region, winning two GT Asia Drivers and Teams Championship, as well as three Malaysia Merdeka Endurance races over the past seven years. Adding to their long-distance credentials are multiple podium finishes in the baddest 12 hours race in Australia. After starting from the back of the grid, team founder and current principal, Mok Weng San, had the car up in third after a tremendous first stint of 26 laps. It was a remarkable turnaround after a disappointing qualifying session. 
By this point in the race, Mok Weng Sun had handed over to Matt Griffin, the quickest driver of the team's driving trio, who soon pulled off this daring maneuver. After being passed by the lead car down one of the track's long straights, Griffin then drafted behind to try and get past Ollie Milroy in the number 91 car. Excellent driving by Griffin, who manages to take the place from the number 91 car, and David Cheng, who was scheduled for a pit stop, gives them a wide berth as he heads into the pit lane to make his schedule stop. In top-level motorsport, the difference between winning and losing can sometimes come down to fractions of a second. The teams and drivers are constantly looking for an edge wherever they can find one. But that advantage is meaningless if it isn't recorded correctly. Let's take a look at what truly makes these races tick. Hi, my name is Matthijs Hoytink. I'm the series manager for the Asian Le Mans series. In terms of technology, probably it's not the most important part of, of, uh, of motorsport. It's actually the cars in terms of technology. Of course, timing is basically the essence of motorsport. I mean, how they do that is by either driving faster or having a faster car. In the Asian Le Mans series, we'll be using an A and B transponder. Which is, uh, which is replaced in the car and is connected to the car battery and it's actually permanently inside the car. Each car will have an individual transponder which has a number on it and it's normally placed at a location where it actually can transmit a signal towards the track. Normally there's also a pit lane loop so at the pit entry and the pit exit so we can measure the stint times and the pit stop times which in endurance racing is, is very important as well. In timing systems there's a few uh, redundancies uh, the first one is that normally the timing system will have a, a unique power source. Secondly, there is basically a, a small machine that manually also logs each car that passes. Thirdly, there's generally an, an optical pickup as well that will actually monitor the car with, a, with an optical pickup. So let's say the transponder doesn't work or it's fallen off the car, the optical pickup will, will be able to see the car and then the timekeeper can manually add in that picture of the car and it will after that automatically recognize the, uh, the cars. The timing loop, it's, it's kind of like an antenna and the transponder is basically a transmitter and the, the transponder transmits a signal multiple times so the timing loop will see it a, a few times but it's like a peak that goes up and down and then at the peak it will take the timing basically. We have chosen the A and B transponder with a driver identification. So we have the normal transponder that's in the car, and then additionally, each driver will get a helmet transponder, which is one of these, and then the system will automatically detect the driver identification. Important tool for the teams to use during the race and, and qualifying. It helps them to, uh, to show what's going on with their own car, but also what's happening with other cars. So based on that, they can maybe make some changes to their strategy. When you look at it, your sector times, you've got basically the timing will become in, in a few different colors. There's the standard white, which means it's the, the normal lap time. And then it's in green, which means it's the driver's personal best. And then it's also purple, which means it's overall best. So these are also extremely important during qualifying because you can probably see that in sector one, you're purple, and then sector two, you're white, and then sector three, you're white again. That means that maybe overall you're not the fastest, but if you know it's purple, 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 then you know that you will have the fastest lap time. Welcome back to the three hours of Shanghai as we join the lead cars at the front of the pack. Here we join car number 90 coming in for a scheduled pit stop. Takeshi Tsuchiya arguably put in the best performance of any driver in the field. After holding off Eurasia's LMP2 for second place for a solid stretch early on, Tsuchiya returned to the pits again in second after staying out 11 laps more than Hatshorn completed for Eurasia. So, yeah, really good start. I uh, catch the so P2 car. Uh, so, I made a big gap, so I was gas. But, uh, so, uh, clear water is uh, very quick, very fast, so lap time. But, uh, uh, I did my best. Then, anyways, uh, end of race, so we, we will Hard. As Tsuchiya mentioned, Clearwater Racing's number 33 Ferrari was providing strong competition, and Matt Griffin was closing fast on Tsuchiya's teammate Yu Lam. Meanwhile, after the drivers switched from Maurice Chen to Marco Siegfried, 
the number 92 BMW Z4 was getting back in the mix as the German started from the back of the field. He had moved up a place by passing the Kraft Bamboo car on lap 36, and Ulam then had a rough welcome to race, finding Seafried in his rearview mirror almost as soon as he got onto the track. With Seafried lapping around five seconds quicker than Ulam, the SLS couldn't hold him up for long, and Seafried went past but was still a lap behind the Mercedes. Bellotti was one of the two drivers still out on their first stints and the Italian would go on to cover 45 laps before handing over to teammate Dennis Lian. Despite one mistake in the first sector on lap 10, Bellotti was putting in some very consistent lap times and was running an impressive third overall by the time he came back into the pits and was in the lead of the CN category. Now we can see that the sun is beginning to set right here at the Shanghai International Circuit and this is one of the challenges the drivers face as this race will finish into the night. Elsewhere on the track, Clearwater's Mac Griffin was in position to strike, riding right behind Yu Lam in the SLS. And Griffin would go past him on lap 40 and up into fourth position overall as he took over the GT category lead. Meanwhile, all eyes were on this battle taking place in the LMP2 category between David Cheng and Pu Jun Jin as the two cars were lapping together for more than 15 laps, often separated by just a few tenths of a second, though admittedly Cheng was a lap ahead. Oak typically races with two drivers rather than the full quota of three. And one benefit of that is that the first driver can run longer in their first stint and then short fuel it to run to the end of their scheduled stint. This saves a lot of refueling time for two of the three stops, and that was already reflected in Cheng's one-lap advantage out on track. Incidentally, only Oak and Team Avalon Formula from the entire grid had chosen to go with two drivers for this race rather than three, with Eurasia now running with Pu Jun Jin, the second of their three drivers. Eurasia Motorsport team principal Mark Goddard had been very pleased with Pooh's Asia Le Mans series debut in Fuji just one race ago. And the Chinese driver was certainly performing well again here in Shanghai, but unable to find a way past David Cheng, having caught up with him pretty sharply. But the onus was on Pooh Jun Jin to make something happen, seeing as he was still a lap down. The team knew that it was critical for Pooh to be on the same lap as Cheng, by which point, a safety car incident would have then wiped out much of Oak's lead. Eurasia team boss Mark Goddard admitted it was a bit of a long shot to hope for that to happen, but with a single lapse of concentration over the three hours able to end the team's race, it was still a genuine possibility. The two continued to lap in tandem, both going past the number 90 SLS at the same point on the track. And though Pu struggled to overtake his rival, as Cheng defended solidly, the pair still put on a great show for their home crowd with some heart-stopping moments. Slowly but surely, it did look like Pu was creeping closer to David Cheng as the Eurasia Motorsport pit crew looks on in anticipation. And this has to be the most exciting moment as Pu makes a huge lunge uh, into the inside corner, trying to find a way past David Cheng. They both run wide off the circuit and back on. Dirty tyres trying to find traction again. And does Pu have the advantage going into the final corner? No, David Cheng just manages to hold that line as Pu is once again sent off onto the runoff area and has to come back on track and rejoins in second position unable to find a way past David Cheng as Pu there trying desperately to clean his tyres before he makes the breaking point into turn one trying to gain more advantage on David Cheng because he realises just how important it is for him to get past David Cheng and be on the same lap as his rival in front of him. Now, even though Pu Jun Jin failed to get past this time around, you can sense that this battle was one that was going to come right down to the wire and he was not going to give up. It was an excellent display of racing as Pu Jun Jin again closed the gap, but Cheng's track positioning was immaculate and there was just no way through. Cheng had earlier come into the pits for a quick top-up of fuel, but he stayed in the car and would only hand over to his teammate Ho Ping Tung after completing a mammoth 52-lap stint, accounting for just over half of the race. 
also into the pits after a lengthy stint was Belotti in the Team Avalon Formula car and he was handing over to teammate Dennis Lian. We are quite competitive. Unfortunately, we have a big problem with the gears. With the gearbox since the beginning of the weekend, we cannot use the paddle. We are using the hand, uh, the manual, which means uh, that it's very hard to be constant uh, through all the stint, but we have done an hour and one hour and 20, and I think that we were P1 in CN and good position over also. So far, so good. It doesn't matter how good a car or driver is, they won't go anywhere without fuel in the tank. Fortunately for the Age of Le Mans series, one of the best brands in the business is on hand as the official fuel supplier. Let's find out what Total brings to the series and why it's so focused on this part of the world. Hey, I'm Patrice Devemi, General Manager of uh, Total Lubricant China. We are partnering with uh, the Age of Le Mans series for the second year this year. We are, we are champion. Uh, we won in 2013, and it was last year an opportunity. It was a, a real true opportunity of promoting the motorsport in China. China is now the second market for lubricant activity in the world after US. But if you look for Total organization worldwide, this is our first market. I'm Eric Reverberé, Total Motorsport, in charge of rallies and endurance program. Well, we have worked uh, for sure on re reliability first, but also on performance. Uh, it means that we try to optimize the efficiency uh, with low friction in the engine, in the box, everywhere uh, that need uh, engine oil. Definitely, Chinese market is the most important market right now for us. If you consider Citroën, which is one of our global partner, uh, Citroën having a, a Chinese shoulder on board uh, with Dongfeng, you can imagine that it's not something which is neutral uh, in our strategy, it's definitely something important for us. The most important is really to pass uh, a lot of message and, and, and the net, the digital initiative we are taking uh, in, uh, after this race are really uh, bringing a lot of uh, new opportunities for us for development. Endurance is a, a real nice support for the initiative we are taking. Asian Monster is a new championship uh, in the second year. Uh, we are at a period of time where we need to have more visibility on, on the future development. Um, this weekend in particular for that will be important because there will be a, a couple of exchanges we will use uh, that uh, weekend for, for, for discussing to know more about what uh, the uh, organizer is willing to do in the future. And you know, we, we are supporting. Welcome back to the three hours of Shanghai. With half of the race now in the books, the positions were beginning to sort themselves out. Clearwater Racing's number 33 Ferrari was leading the competitive GT category, with Matt Griffin still behind the wheel. The Irishman is a current European Le Mans Series champion and was using his experience to full effect, logging his team's best lap time of 1 minute 47.089 early in his stint. Back at the front, David Cheng was coming to the end of his stint, which meant that Pu Junjin in the Eurasia number 27 car would finally get some open track to show how quick he could race unimpeded. But it brought to a close one of the best battles we've seen in the Asian Le Mans series so far this year, with two evenly matched rivals giving it everything. The fans certainly appreciated some great racing and the drivers also enjoyed going toe-to-toe -to -toe around one of the best tracks in this region. Let's hear now from David Cheng after his long stint as race leader. Halfway through, the, uh, halfway through my second stint, he kind of caught up and we started having a go at it like it was, uh, like it was for the lead of the race. You know, I think uh, all season long, it's been hard to get some good battles and uh, this one will lasted for, I think, at least a good 15 laps. Uh, there was quite a few chances where he was really trying to pass me, but I just defended hard. Um, you know, treated this thing like it was for uh, the lead of a race. With a lap on him, Ho Pin's in the car now, I think should be relatively smooth sailing from here, but one and a half hours ago, you never know. Back on track, Oli Milroy was deep into his stint in the number 91 Team AI car, 
and had already moved up two places. The Briton had previously tested for Formula One, but switched from single-seaters to GT cars a few years ago and hasn't looked back. Milroy's best lap time of 1 minute 48.272 was also his team's best of the day as he was trying to move further up the field. Meanwhile, Kevin C in Kraft Bamboo's number 77 car was pushing hard at the front of his field and he ended up pushing a bit too hard, locked his brakes and ended up stuck in the gravel trap. Fortunately, a safety car wasn't deemed necessary since his car was not posing any danger and racing continued while the marshals here, as you can see, tried to help C free his car from the gravel trap. Once the marshals pulled him far out enough, they were able to free him and Kevin C was able to get away once again. But of course, having paid the penalty of that very lengthy delay. With the two-hour mark approaching, Pu Jin Jin came into the pits on lap 57 after recording some quicker lap times after David Cheng had stepped aside and left him some free track. He temporarily got on the same lap as the Oak car due to a driver change, but his teammate James Winslow rejoined a lap down after their own swap. Just now, um, I have a chance to get close to David Chen, but when I get close, um, it's really hard to fight with him. Um, when I follow him, uh, he's losing grip. So I tried to get close when I exit, but our car don't, don't have any advantage on the straight. So every time I straight, I cannot get close even use a free stream or something, but there's one chance he mistake, but also I got mistake because I lock up the tire and then the car suddenly move and then, okay, I control that, but David Chen, he, he mistake to go out and then we side by side, that's a quite exciting moment. But anyway, I'm not happy with my, my performance because I cannot overtake him and then we're losing time. Uh. With Cheng now watching safely from the sidelines, he was left to his Chinese teammate, Ho Ping Tung, to carry the torch for Oak Racing Team Total. And he set about the task with his usual speed. Tung was lapping around three to four seconds per lap quicker than his teammate, leaving Eurasia Motorsports with an almighty challenge on their hands if they were to get back into the race and make up some ground in the overall standings. But everything was running smoothly for the boys in black, and the win streak looks set to continue. But Eurasia had saved their quickest driver for last, and James Winslow, seen here through the number 92 car windscreen, was doing everything in his power to keep pressure on the leaders and perhaps force a mistake. Meanwhile, Kevin C, who had managed to get his car back on the track, was headed back into the pits for a routine safety check. The crew also took the opportunity to have a driver change as well, and Su handed over to Naoki Yokomizu for the final stint. The pit stop was a remarkably routine one, having just been out in the kitty litter. Not surprisingly, Yokomizu rejoined at the back of the field, but with more than an hour remaining, there was still plenty of time to progress. Yeah, in the end, I think there's a little bit of problem with the, um, with the car. Uh, the throttle stuck open a little bit. So I uh, locked up the brakes and got into the gravel, but um, the car is okay. So uh, hopefully now he can finish the race and get, get some points. Kevin said so they're making it clear in that interview that finishing the race was now the team's primary goal. But the number 21 car was still their division rival and was now more than two laps ahead. Dennis Lian had slowed slightly after his blistering opening pace when he set the team's fastest lap of 1 minute 49.544. But it was still a comfortable cushion ahead of the Kraft Bamboo Racing entry. Race management had become the priority for Avalon, especially with reliability such a key part of endurance racing at any level. Dutch Chinese racer Ho Ping Tung was continuing to set the pace at the front lapping some of the others in the field multiple times. But each time he passed another car, it would give the others a chance to draft behind him if they could. And as Ollie Milroy was coming to the end of his middle stint for the number 91 BMW, he was trying to keep pace with Tung as they lapped in tandem for a while. 
Next, Ulam brought the SLS AMG GT3 car into the pits and the Mercedes' race continued to turn for the worse after such a promising start. As the driver would explain, a few technical issues had been hindering his progress, but some quick fixes during the changeover meant that the car was still good to go for Takamitsu Matsui as he sought to bring home points for the team. Ulam's times had been consistent, but a little off the pace, and the SLS was now down in fifth, having been up in second at the start. Yeah, yeah it's, it doesn't have traction control, so I cannot push hard. So the lap, lap time down, so the Ferrari take over me, yeah. At exactly the same time Ulam came into the pits, Car number 92, which had been hot on the heels of the SLS, also pitted. But the team stop was a little slower than their rivals. So whereas Seafried just narrowed the gap to a few seconds, Jörg Müller found himself nearly half a minute behind the SLS when he took to the track. As always, the car gets the full treatment of tyres and fuel whenever there is a driver changeover. With the technical crews doing a fantastic job, despite having only a fraction of the manpower seen in other racing series. Let's hear from Marco Seafried after his stint in the car. Just hope when we don't lose anymore, or if we lose anymore, that the temperature will rise and maybe then we have to stop, I do not know. But I catch back some, uh, some seconds, some gap, but uh, we had actually a bad stop. Uh, I came in right behind the SLS. But our car, I think, left around about 15 to 20 seconds later. So actually, everything I catched up was ruined by the pit stop. So it was a little disappointing, but so it was racing. Um, yeah. Seafried obviously disappointed, but as he said, that's racing. Welcome back to the three hours of Shanghai and Clearwater Racing had been third overall and leading the GT category since the midway point of the race. And while they briefly moved down a place during their final pit stop, the team regained their spot when their rivals pitted later. Keito Sawa took over the final stint and was almost as quick as the man he had just replaced, Mac Griffin. I did a quite a long stint, more or less an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, tires are holding up well. I mean, the Michelin rubber is doing really, really well. Um, obviously, the, the grip level deteriorates throughout the stint, as you'd expect. But at the end of my stint, I was still able to do very, very good lap time. So, uh, you know, all credit to Michelin uh, for bringing out a great product. The team would essentially complete what would be their last pit stop of the day. And headlights were now essential with daylight fading fast. But Sawa in the number 33 Ferrari was just moments away from maintaining Clearwater's perfect record in the GT category in the Asian Le Mans series, with the car comfortably ahead of the three team AAI entries, who would finish fourth, fifth, and sixth overall. As darkness descended very quickly in eastern China, the final positions were taking shape. The CN prototype cars have reduced visibility compared to some of the other cars, so it had been decided to end their race 15 minutes earlier to allay safety concerns. But Team Avalon Formula had been forced into a lengthy pit stop just 20 minutes previously, meaning that Kraft Bamboo Racing were able to take their third straight win, despite the drama when Kevin C ran off the track earlier. Kevin C was the only driver to have featured in all three wins for the team, and he celebrated with Samson Chan as Naoko Yokomitsu safely negotiated the final stages and brought the car home for another 25 points. At the front of the field, the remaining cars were still out on track to complete the three hours of Shanghai. With darkness fully upon them, which is very reminiscent of the Le Mans 24-hour race in France, the drivers took the checkered flag at 6 o'clock local time. Ho Ping Tung would go on to take maximum points for Oak for the fifth straight race in the Asian Le Mans series, a run that stretches back to last season. 
So it's another victory for Oak Racing, who win the LMP2 class. Eurasia comes second, while Clearwater take honours in the GT category. Meanwhile, it is Craft Bamboo who take top honours in the CN category. In the overall Team Series ranking, Oak Racing Team Total lead with 77 points, Craft Racing lead the CN Division with 75 points, and Car Number 91 AI lead the GT Championship with 50 points. And that concludes the three hours of Shanghai. Be sure to join us for the next round, which is also the final round of the Asian Le Mans Series in Malaysia. Until then, bye-bye. Great race again. Uh, Oak Racing Team Total did a flawless job again this weekend. I have to say, uh, everyone within the team is uh, outstanding. And uh, my teammate David Chang did a really great first stint. So for me, it was basically just uh, consolidating the uh, gap that we had. So yeah, it was a pretty easy drive for me. I'd like to say thanks to uh, the teammates and the team for a fantastic job. I'm very, very happy. So, I'm a bit in the race. Uh, I did a self-stint for our 